Good morning, world. Good morning, congregation. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now, this is another day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing in it. We uh, invite you to enjoy service today and to praise and worship the Lord and to learn from the Lord and to bask in his presence here at Second Baptist and Roselle of New Jersey, all the way from Roselle, New Jersey. Second Baptist, all the way from Roselle, New Jersey, reaching, trying to reach out to the outermost parts of the world. Let us stand together as we sing our opening hymn. We'll be singing hymn number 248, God's Hold to God's unchanging hand. Amen? Amen? It's a familiar one. Let's represent, let's sing nice and loud to the Lord and for the Lord. Amen. 
always make this face in this God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Yeah, hold to God's unchanging hand. Ladies, ladies. So we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your teaching. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 As we remain standing, please turn with me to your scripture reading. We're coming from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 25 through 31. And I made sure I brought my Bible with the big letters. Uh, as I get a little older, my eyes do too. I bought the big letters today so I can read it without struggling. I'll see about getting reading glasses later on. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25 to 31. And verse 25 reads, To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? that bringeth out their host by number. He called them all by names by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord and Creator, of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths, youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. 
and they shall walk and not faint. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I was thinking recently, and I was reminded of, if you, if you go backwards, about 20 years in my life. And I was um, going places, whatever I talk, I was going places that I shouldn't go, doing things that I shouldn't do. And I'm reminded that on every Friday, a friend of mine and myself, and sometimes a couple other friends, we would go to a club. Nothing good to find in clubs, young people. Believe me, you're wasting your time. But anyway, we would go to this club every Friday. And my friend was always uh, really, he really always wanted to go. He's always pressing to go. I've always been a homebody. I stay home, play video games, watch sports, I'm good. But he always wanted to go, and we were very close. So he always pressed me to go, come on, let's go, let's go, so I would go. And this one time, after we were going almost every Friday for years, he called and he said, hey, you know, I just don't feel like going tonight. And that was a shock, because he always wanted to go. Like I said, he was the one that wanted to go everywhere. So I said, okay, you know, I was, I was fine with that. We didn't go. That night at that club in Elizabeth, New Jersey, these 20 some odd years ago, someone had a gun and someone let off shots in the club and there was a stampede and the stampede killed, if I remember correctly, three or four people. And I used to go every, every Friday night. That Friday night, we didn't go. You fast forward 20 some years, a totally different situation in my life. I have a wife and five kids now. I'm not going to clubs anymore. But I was driving the car home one day and I realized the oil was low because I had uh, not taken care of the oil. Not the minivan for some, for some of you who know my family's cars, the older car. So I stopped at the gas station on the way home from work from Hillside, New Jersey, the gas station. I believe it's an Exxon on 22, right before you get to um, the parkway entrances on the right hand side. And I asked the gas attendant for some oil. He gave me some oil and he went on about his business. I know how to pour oil. I didn't use a spout. The car was hot. I didn't use a spout. And I poured the oil. And I missed, thinking I can, you know, I can pour it, you know. Us men sometimes overly confident of ourselves. I pour it, I won't miss. I missed. <laughs> fire inside the car, straight up. So I run to the gas attendant, I said, there's a fire. He says, oh, okay. <laughs> so I go, there's a fire, fire in my car. But by the time we got back out to the car, the Lord had made the fire. Let's go straight down. So that's just two instances when I could have died or I could have been burned or I could have been hurt. And I, when I thought about that, 20 something years ago. And I thought about that within the last year. It reminded me of what God has done for me and how he's always been there protecting me even when I was places where I shouldn't be or places I should be. Because right? I should be, I should be at the club. I should be getting oil. But he followed me the whole time. And it reminded me of this. Great is your mercy towards me, your loving kindness towards me, your tender mercies I see day after day. Great is your mercy. 
we want to make sure that we govern ourselves accordingly um, with these notices and announcements. I'm just going to go through all of them. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I don't want to. I want to make sure I don't miss anything. So, uh, special prayer request: We have Sister Renee Smith and family in the loss of her father in Jamaica this past Friday. We want to keep Renee Smith and family, the boys, and husband, and everyone in in, in prayer. Uh, Miss Brianna Durham and the loss of her paternal grandmother this past Thursday. Her grandma on her dad's side passed away. Um, the aunt of Sister Katisha Getty is currently hospitalized with COVID, so we want to make sure that we keep her in prayer, in serious prayer. Sister Gabriella George, Sister Idris Sykes, Sister Marion Williams, and Sister Sharon Smith. We want to make sure that we're keeping them in prayer. And I know I keep saying keeping them in prayer over and over, but we do want to make sure that we're keeping them Amen. in prayer. Amen. We want to keep in prayer the sick and shut-in members, the, all of the bereaved, any, any of those we may have missed that are in the notes here, and those in the military and law enforcement. And we also want to uh, keep in prayer the sister of Sister Julie Jewell. Her name is Musetta. I was hospitalized, I believe, this morning, I believe, uh, if not late, late last night. So we want to keep her in prayer. Another birthday this week, tomorrow, September 20th, is uh, Miss Super Intelligent Nyla Bartholomew. Oh. Super Intelligent, so we want to we make sure that we uh, wish her a happy birthday, send her a message, give her a call, or call her mom or dad, or whatever. Happy birthday. I'm not sure how old she is. Um, I'm not going to guess. I think it was 14. I was going to say 14, and I got nervous. So it might be 14. Amen, amen. Anniversaries this week. Thursday, September 23rd, Brother Jean and Sister Marianne Nazir, 44 years. 44. They got married this year. Oh, I'll be 45 this year. So, so they've been married as long as I've been on this earth. God bless you. Hallelujah. And Saturday, this is near and dear to my heart, Saturday, September 25th, Brother William and Sister Yvonne Tyree, 50 years, 50 years. They waited five years to have me. They enjoyed their life until 1976. Just kidding. And may they have a blessed day. Um, we want to remind each other that um, next week, morning worship will move from 10 to 10.30, as it did this week. And our in-person Sunday school uh, will take place next week. Am I correct on that? It will take, take place next week um, from 9 a.m. to 10.15. So service will start till 10.30, and we honored that today, even though we had to postpone the beginning of Sunday school until next week. Um, so Sunday school won't begin, will begin, we'll begin at 9 o'clock a.m. on this coming Sunday, and it'll be from 9 to 10.15. You got 15 minutes to get yourself together, and then get ready for service at 10.30. Please plan accordingly. Um, there's, here's an update for coming events next Sunday, Oh, I just said that. Okay, so Saturday, it's October 2nd, Second Baptist Church Youthic Explosion. Uh, okay, let's try to get it. Okay, so next Saturday, it's on October 2nd, is Second Baptist Church's SBC's Youth Explosion. Hey, there we go. Y'all ain't old. Youth Explosion will take place in the parking lot from 3 to 5 p.m. The theme will be reigniting our fire in a troubled world. Scripture, Leviticus 6, 12 through 13. Minister Elijah Freyson of Freeson, I may be saying it wrong as the guest preacher. All youth that would like to participate with a gift or talent, please contact Deaconess Star McDowell or Sister Marilena James. So they, you guys all know them if you, wanna, if you want to um, showcase your, the talent or the gift that God has given you. It's quite all right. Just contact Sister Deaconess Star or Sister James. Amen? Amen. 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 Pretty, Amen. Pretty, Pretty Campbell. Pretty Campbell, what? Add me to the list. Oh, add me to the list. Well, I ain't got the list. No, she means add me to the people to contact. Oh, and okay. Oh, I thought you meant add her to gifts and talents. You, now, you know you got to explain in detail when I'm up here because I'll get you. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, so she'll be added also to the contact. So you can contact Sister Marley the James, Deaconess Star, or Sydney Brittany, Brittany 
camel. Sister Brittany, camel. Camel, right? I got it right? Okay, amen. Uh, please note, church virtual office hours are currently 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Saturday morning. And I repeat, church virtual office hours for the church secretary are currently 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturday mornings and they're into the afternoon to 1 p.m. Please use Facebook Messenger or email the church at sbcroselnj at gmail.com. That's SBC, Second Baptist Church, sbcroselnj at gmail.com. Seven days a week with any questions or inquiries. Response time can take up to 48 hours. Please be patient. Also, um, we, will, we want to remind you of our opportunities to give. Um, don't forget our missions, building, and scholarship funds. Your option one, you can mail it in directly to the church, PO Box 304, or you can see a diaconate member. Option two, you can drop off on, sun, on Sundays between 9 and 10.30 a.m. before service starts. Option three, electronically through the text to give feature from the Aplos website. All you do is text GIVE in capital letters G-I-V, then you put the amount. You do not have to use a dollar sign. So you, let's say you're giving five dollars. Give well. Let's let's up that. Let's say you give it a hundred dollars. Give one zero zero and and two eight three three five six one zero one seven nine. Again, that text number is eight three three five six one zero one seven nine. And then you can follow the prompts to set up your account. Ways to stay connected is prayer calls Monday through Friday at five forty five a.m. six p.m. and Friday at twelve noon. The phone number is 605-475-3215. That's 605-475-3215. And the access code is 916-920, pound 916-920. This weekly in-person Sunday school starting as we shared this coming Sunday at 9 a.m. to 1015. This in-person worship service with social distancing and Zoom on Zoom and Facebook, Instagram Live, and conference call. We have the conference call here, too, at 10.30 a.m. Sundays. YouTube playback is always available. Tuesday Bible studies at 10.30 a.m. and then again at 7 p.m. via conference call. The dial-in for that is 978-990-5000. And the access code for that is 374-329-POUND. The playback, if you want to hear a Bible study that you missed, is 978-990-5099. So the dial-in for when it's actually happening, the Bible study at 10.30 a.m. or 7 p.m. is 978-990-5000. And the playback for one you missed is 978-990-5099. The access code for both is 374-329-POUND. Thursday night young adult Bible study is every seven, every uh, Thursday at 7.30 with myself, Pastor Mike, via Zoom. See me if you would like to get a text reminder. Please note, church family, as our doors are open for church services in person, please stay connected for updates through the diaconate and ministry leaders. Measures are in place to ensure confidential health screening, social distancing, and hygienic practices. We ask that when in service, masks remain on the entire time, even with social distancing. Cover your mouth and nose at all times. I'm not out of order. That doesn't count for when you're speaking from the pulpit. Please contact Deacon Joseph Williams at 908-245-4717 or Reverend Burley Jones, 973-704-1040, should you need anything. Church virtual office hours, as we shared, are going to be from Saturday on Saturday mornings, 8 to 1. And we share the rest of that message. At this time, um, we're going to have a medical moment by Reverend Joanne Williams, as per Pastor Moore, a medical moment, uh, making an appeal on behalf of SBC's medical professionals. Amen? Amen. God bless her as she comes. COVID-19 cases, brand new. 
So the virus is not dead. So this is an appeal to everyone who has not gotten vaccinated. You know, our Lord and Savior tells us that we should treat our neighbors as ourselves. And your neighbors are everyone. People that you live next door to, people in your community, people that you work with, people that you sit next to the bus, train, airplane, everyone. And because of world travel, we are all neighbors more than we think. So it really behooves you to get the vaccination if you have not received it. We don't want to lose any more people. The vaccine is free, so you don't have to come out of pocket. And if by chance you have a loved one at home who is unable to get out, you can have a home visit from a nurse to get the vaccine. Or if someone is home um, because they have other issues and they need to get the vaccine, that can happen. So I behoove you, please get the vaccine. Nothing to be afraid of. I've received it. I am standing. I had no after effects at all. Some people may get a little temp, maybe a sore arm. Sometimes you feel tired, you know, but other than that, you should be good. So please, please, please get the vaccine. We don't want to lose any other people. Some, you can still get the virus if you have the vaccine, but it's a mild case and you're not dying. And we want to prevent the death. So please get the vaccine. Amen? Amen. Good morning again to everyone. Good morning. This is another day the Lord has made. We're rejoicing, being glad in it. Thank you, Reverend Joanne, for sharing our uh, medical moment. We're going to be doing this uh, weekly, to God be the glory. And thank God for our uh, 1030 a.m. services now that our Sunday school will resume at 9 a.m. to until 1015. I want to thank God uh, for this uh, past Tuesday morning's Bible study. Uh, we had a tag team, dynamic duo tag team in the person of uh, Deacon Eduardo Reefer, Reverend uh, uh, Vanessa Reefer, praise the Lord. And it was a tag team that it was like putting uh, Bobo Brazil and, uh, uh, and Haystack Calhoun together, amen, uh, as teammates, praise God, because they gave the devil a thousand black eyes, and he's only got two, but they, they really did a job, amen, and encouraged the saints of God. So we thank you, uh, Reverend Vanessa, and the <laughs> of God. It was wonderful how they just intertwined and Co make, you know, just work together in that Bible study. It was awesome. You have to do that a little bit more often, praise God. Tag, tag team, praise God. Hallelujah. I can just envision them just tagging each other like, oh, I got this, I got this, praise God. That was just wonderful, praise God. Uh, but thank you again, Brother Mike, uh, for leading us thus far and for one and all that are here uh, next week also. Uh, we're anticipating to uh, go by way of Zoom. So in addition to our uh, Sunday morning uh, service that uh, uh, Sister Brittany is doing, amen, with uh, Instagram and Facebook Live and Kendrick doing our telephone conference live. We want to go Zoom, to God be the glory. So Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Hallelujah. Amen. We're taking off in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, Dr. Damien Floyd and uh, Brother Godfrey, they'll be working together, amen, to uh, help us with that media technology. Amen. In Jesus' name. Uh, but the most important announcement of all is this, and I hope we have gotten the things we have charged into our heads, not to our hearts. Most important announcement of all is this, Jesus Christ is soon to come, and it appears to be ready, because ready or not, Jesus is coming. My question to you is, are you ready? Could you look to your neighbor, to your left, to your right, in front of you, behind you, and say, neighbor? Neighbor. Ready or not? Ready or not. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? And look to another neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor. Oh, neighbor, ready or not, ready or not. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Are, you ready? Are you ready? And as Smokey the Christian Bear would say, only you can prevent eternal fires. <laughs> so mind you, we're using all of our proper uh, protocol to God be the glory. I'm just putting this over the microphone right now. We have microphone covers. Amen. Our church has been thoroughly sanitized. 
uh, we sanitize before and after our services. So you, when you come in, this sanctuary has been sanitized twice. Amen. Once before you come in, once after you leave, and the next Sunday morning, once before you come in, and then once after you leave, we do that every week. To God be the glory. So I turn it back into the hands, service into the hands of Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Let's govern ourselves accordingly, and especially with the final announcement that Jesus Christ is soon to come. Uh, during the Smokey, the Christian Bear announcement, I think I think Vincent began to come up with a theme song. What was it? Was it something like that? <laughs> so we'll maybe we'll come up with a theme song, Pastor. Huh? Huh? I'll let the kids write it. Amen. That's, you know what? That's what we're gonna come up with a theme song. Well, we'll talk about it later. Amen. Amen. Well, it's preaching time. Well, it's preaching time. Well, it's preaching time. You know what? Allowed, the people weren't allowed to be in the house of God. Uh, you know, there was the veil, the veil of the temple, twelve feet thick, and, and the, the the one priest went into the holy of holies, and uh, no one else was able to go. We are right here at the access of the pulpit, and I think sometimes, well, I know I do. I say we, but I know I do. We forget how holy this place is, and how privileged we are, beyond privilege, because we don't deserve to be here. You know, we 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 should have been cast away. For Christ died for us that we could come into the Holy of Holies and that we can have eternal life. And we should be happy and joyful when it's time to hear from him through our pastor. So it's preaching time, and we have a preacher here who's going to preach straight from the heart of God. The heart of God is downloading the information into the heart of Pastor Moore, and he's then sharing it and downloading it into our hearts. So I ask that you keep your hearts open to what the Lord is saying through Pastor Moore what the Lord is saying to you about your specific situation through Pastor Moore, what the Lord is saying to us as a church, as Christians as a whole, as a Christian community, as Christians in this evil world, through the words of Pastor Moore. So pray with me, raise your right hands in his direction and say, God bless, God bless. Pastor Moore. God, use God use Pastor Moore. Pastor Moore. God, speak to my heart, God, speak to my heart. through the words of your manservant, Pastor James E. Moore, Sr., in Jesus' name, amen. The next voice you'll hear after the hymn of aspiration, which is hymn number 249, the next voice you'll hear across this pulpit will be that of our own, Pastor James E. Moore, Sr., hear ye him. Let us stand together and sing hymn number 249.
My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. May God continuously add a rich blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy word. Wait, but don't procrastinate. We find there's a, a stark and drastic difference uh, between the word wait and procrastinate. Wait means to stay in place in expectation of something. Wait means to delay doing something or to remain stationary in readiness or expectation. Wait means to pause for another to catch up, to look forward expectantly. Wait also means to be ready and available. Wait also means to remain temporarily neglected or unrealized. It also means being in a state or attitude of watchfulness and expectancy. That's wait. But the word procrastinate is completely different. Procrastinate means to put off intentionally and habitually. Procrastinate means uh, intentionally putting off doing something that should be done. It means to lag, to loiter, to dawdle, to dally. Some people call it dilly-dally. Procrastinate means to act or move slowly so as to fall behind. To procrastinate means to delay so much that one enters into a state of laziness, apathy, or complacency. For example, that that, that little proverbial frog in the water pot that we're talking about, how can you boil a frog alive? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you put a frog in hot water in a boiling uh, pot, frogs will jump out. Just like you and I, you jump in the bathtub or the shower, especially the shower, when the shower's too hot, you jump out. <laughs> Amen. Do I have a witness? <laughs> Praise the Lord, too hot, <laughs> jump out. To God be the glory. Frogs gonna jump out. But put the frog in some moderate, cool tempered water. Turn the heat up. Imagine this frog's in a pot. You want to cook them alive. And this frog, and pardon me for sounding so uh, you know, animated and uh, frog legs. Yeah, frog legs, right? Uh, it, it sounds cool, but uh, some folks do it with lobsters. But but you turn the temperature up until the frog feels a little uncomfortable to get ready to jump out of the pot and you turn the flame off. Let the frog get accustomed to its new elevated temperature. So now the frog says, okay, maybe it's not so bad. I'll stay right here. Once the frog is comfortable with its new elevated temperature, turn the flame up again. Let it get a little hotter. Frog's starting to sweat. It's starting to feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe I need to get out, the frog is thinking. And you turn, when you realize that, you turn the flame off so that the frog can get accustomed to the new elevated temperature. Mm -hmm. Now you turn the flame up again because the frog is uh, feeling so relaxed that it falls asleep. You know how in the summertime uh, you get so uh, you know, overwhelmed with the heat that it just puts you to sleep? And this frog falls asleep, and now you have the frog. You elevate the temperature, and you just boiled that frog alive. Because little by little, the temperature has been elevated. And that's what the devil does 
with us as human beings. Mm -hmm. Just a little sin. Yeah. Like bro cream, a little dab of do you. Mm. Amen. Uh, do you remember that commercial? Bro cream, bro cream, a little dab of do you. They always want to run your fingers through your hair. Amen. <laughs> Might not remember that commercial. I'm taking myself. You remember that? Thank you. Oh, I have one witness. All right. Praise God. Bro cream. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, a, a little sin. Amen. But realize a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Take that clump of uh, dough with no leaven in it, and that's all it is. It, it won't swell and rise or expand. But you put some leaven in it, what we call yeast, mm -hmm. and it rises. Now, uh, sometimes we men don't really know so much about uh, the culinary field as far as uh, putting yeast in food. So sometimes as fellas feel, well, maybe I'll put about five packets, six <laughs> packets, you know, like sugar. You know, when you take the little sugar pouches and you put them in your coffee or tea or whatever, well, maybe, maybe to make it extra uh, sweet, we'll put five more packets of sugar in the coffee. Well, we're, we're thinking maybe if I put about five packets of root, uh, yeast in there, it, it'll be just right. And you'll find that it's going to fill your oven. <laughs> That's too much. But a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump. And then the devil tries to get us uh, satisfied uh, with, with sin to the point that just a little sin, but then he expands and says, well, that wasn't so bad. Let's do a little bit more. Let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Before you know it, you're captured. You become a slave to sin. Satan ultimately wants that sin to take your soul to hellfire, where you'll be destroyed eternally forever. But the Bible says uh, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God wants us to wait on him. He wants us to trust him, but he wants us to wait with the spirit and the mind of expectancy as far as when he's going to give our marching orders, when he's going to give us instructions to do or not to do. So we need to be in a, in a position in our minds and souls and spirit of readiness and we're just waiting for the Lord that when the Lord says, go, we go. It's just like in the Olympics this past year. Uh, Sidney McLaughlin, uh, one of the high school standouts from Union Catholic in New Jersey, over there in Scotch Plains, she won and came in first place in the Olympic race. Did you see her? Very fast, right? Well, when those runners are on the mark, they're waiting for instructions. They don't just do what they want to do. They have to listen for the instruction. And so they can exercise, they can go into the blocks, and they can practice how it is to spring away from the blocks, and they can, you know, calisthenics, so they can stretch or whatever they want to do. Uh, but, but then when, when the caller says, runners to your mark, everybody gets down into the, into the blocks, they stretch their legs, and they get themselves ready and positioned to jettison out of those blocks. And so runners to your mark, their heads down and they're silent, they're quiet, they're waiting for the command. Get set and you notice the bodies go up because they're ready to spring off. And they're waiting for the proper time for the, <coughs> for the gun to go off. Now if they jump prematurely, yeah. I think if they do it two times, they're totally disqualified. So if nine or ten runners are on the line, they're set, and one jumps off too early, there's, there's a, a gun that's shot to bring them back. <coughs> Two times, stop, stop, come back to the line. And that causes a lot of frustration. Yeah. Because you were ready for this one time to give it your all. And you might have done that, but you lost your opportunity because you're going to have to do it all over again. And so sometimes you're, you're waiting and you, you jump prematurely. You have to wait for the proper time and the proper command. And then there are times where you wait too late. Where, and then you, you in a split second, you miss uh, the opportunity to jump when the gun is fired. And now you end up being behind your competitors. And so timing is everything. Yeah. 
And so they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Means that there are instructional moments of time that as we wait, we wait on the Lord for instruction, for guidance, for directions to do or not to do so that we're in right standing with God and so that we're in sync with the plan of Almighty God. Now, Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 28 to verse 30 says, For which of you, this is Jesus saying, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he had after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Sometimes it's necessary to wait and to take a pause so that we can assess, so that we can evaluate, so that we can plan. See, because there are times when, when you're planning to do things, and it's wonderful to plan and to have goals and dreams and aspirations, mm -hmm. but it's always a blessing, amen, to follow along in God's own time, in his own planning, with his own purpose, amen, being guided by him, realizing that if, if, if it's a career that you're pursuing, if it's a uh, an entrepreneurship business that you're trying to open, uh, you need to first sit down and plan. You need to sit down and count the cost. Jesus is saying this, that a man that intends to build a tower, if he doesn't sit down first and count the cost, whether he has sufficient funds and resources to finish it, that person's going to be mocked if they can't finish it. He says, what, what would happen if happily, after you have laid the foundation, you're not able to finish it? You know what's going to happen? The people that come by, they're going to look at you and look at the building that you could not finish, and they're going to mock you, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. And that's a poor commentary because they know that you never finish what you start. Because the God that we serve finishes everything that he starts. He started it, he'll finish it. Some people can start a good fight, can't finish it. But he that began a good work in us, he shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He started it, he'll, he'll finish it. And so God wants us to, uh, to, to assess and evaluate and plan. Do you have the funds that are necessary to build this building? That's why we thank God sometimes there's a uh, little headbutting uh, with, with, uh, with people. And uh, when you have a trustee ministry, trustee ministry saying, well, uh, let's look at reality. Reality says uh, we don't have uh, $5 million dollars uh, to build this building. We only have a thousand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now there might be some in the congregation that said, oh, you, you just have to have faith. <laughs> but the trustees say, oh, but, but you, you just have to have money. <laughs> you have to have finances, praise God. So reasoning and faith have to work together. Praise God. Common sense especially. <laughs> but faith Amen. And leadership from God. Yes. Now, it's rare that it's going to be that, that extreme where you got a thousand dollars trying to build a five million dollar project. That's rare. Amen. But if God is in the plan and he's saying do it, then do it. Praise God. But there has to be an amazingly uh, a tremendous affirmation by God to everybody involved. This is the plan of God. Similar to God telling Moses Tell all the people to stand still and see the salvation of your God. Because I'm going to part the sea. 
and you're going to walk across on dry ground. That's one of those impossible situations. And it takes a heap of faith. Amen. Amen. But God was in the plan. And when God is in the plan, he, the one that specializes in impossibilities, then it's going to work. He'll take two fish and five loaves and feed 5,000 people, feed 25,000 people, feed multitudes of people with the smallest of things. Literally comes much from and place it in the mouth of hands. Yes, but then there are times where God said, now, I'm, I'm going to now bring you into the, re the realistic reality world of things. And I want you to be responsible to do some things. Yeah. I'm not going to do all your work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you go through some struggles. I'm going to let you have some blood, sweat, and tears. I'm going to let you have some frustrations and some setbacks so that you can appreciate the things that I do for you, that you can appreciate the things that you've gained, so that you can appreciate the advantages. Because no pain, no gain, the athletes say. Amen. You have to put in the work to get those muscles. Amen. You can't, you can't just sit there on the couch and, 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 and dream up muscles. Amen. You can't sit on the couch and dream up uh, jogging uh, 25 miles or 15 miles or 5 miles. You, you, you can't dream up amen, uh, becoming a, a superstar athlete amen, by just sitting on the couch and reading magazines and books. No, you have to put in the work. You have to put in the time. You have to do what's necessary. And so in starting a business, uh, you're working a job. You can't just quit the job and say, I'm just going to start my own business. Well, where are your funds? Where's your money? Uh, how are you planning on making the money? Do you have a business plan? Uh, in your business, do you need a lawyer? Uh, entertainment lawyer? Uh, do, if, being that you're getting into entertainment business, do you have an entertainment lawyer? People are going to want to sue you. Amen. Uh, do you have a good CPA? A person that's going to do your taxes and also do your books and give you some financial guidance. Uh, maybe it's something where you're going to need a, a sociologist or a psychologist or a doctor or a nurse to be involved in your business pursuits. So you're going to have to rely upon professionals that know what they're doing that have already done the work so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel so that you can become successful. There's a, an organization called B'nai B'rith. It's a Jewish organization which uh, they fund Jewish entrepreneurs uh, in business ventures. But first they want to see the business plan. They want to sit down and interview you and see what your intent is. It's almost like the, the Shark Tank people. They want to see uh, what, what, what your idea is. And most of the Shark Tank uh, people, when, when the idea is not as good, they say, mm, nah, I, I'm not going to support this. And then others are excited, uh, and some of them are sitting on the edge of the seat saying, tell me more, and I'm going to support this. And tell you what, uh, I only want, instead of the 40% that, that you're asking, uh, I, 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 I'm, only, uh, I'm going to give you 60%. I'm going to give you 70%. I'll, I'll just take third uh, because I, said, I, I believe in this idea. And B'nai B'rith does that to the point they'll support your business venture. And then if it fails, you can come back, retool, re and they will refuel you if they feel that uh, the, the, the initial plan that you had didn't work, though they thought it would. Uh, but once they re, uh, re I guess, Finagled, or not finagled, but they, they, they adjusted, readjusted the plan and see that it's now going to work, they'll find you to the point of success. Well, God wants us to be wise in our deportment. I think that's what we even use in our church covenant, to be wise in our deportment. But God wants us to wait, but he does not want us to procrastinate. Some people just keep on waiting and keep on waiting. Now, can you imagine being on the starting line, runners to your wife, get set, and you're still there in the blocks. And they ran the race, and you haven't jumped off yet. You're guaranteed to lose, for sure. You're not coming in first place, second or third. You're not getting a gold, bronze, or silver. Uh, matter of fact, you'll probably be disqualified. 
Now, I did have the opportunity uh, just several years back. I think it was about five years ago. I ran in the pen relays, the, the 60, the 860, the 865 Masters 100 meter race. Mm. And, and thanks be to God, I ran that race at the pen relays. It was exciting, y'all. And I came in ninth place. I came in ninth place. I was so excited. <laughs> now, what I didn't tell you, that I came in ninth place out of nine runners. <laughs> That's equivalent to last place. <laughs> but I ran. I was running. And I, I ran in some a world champion runners. That was their race. They do 100 meters. I'm not a long distance runner. I, I'm sorry, I'm not a sprinter. I'm a long distance runner. So I run the two mile, the five mile. I've done a marathon, praise God. And so I, I'm a pacer. I pace myself. But as far as speed is concerned, I did not have that. And it was proven that day when I came in last place because I think the first place runner beat me by about 30 yards. That's a whole lot. That's how fast they were. I was just left behind. It's like, Boy, I don't even belong in this league. <laughs> but to God be the glory, uh, you, you have to still run the race because this race that we're talking about of salvation, this race is not given to the swift. And it's not given to the strong, but it's given to them that will endure to the end. So regardless and in spite of your op opposition and your obstacles of life, your hurdles that you have to uh, uh, jump over, and all of the uh, uh, challenges that are presented, just be persistent to keep your eyes on the prize, keeping your eyes on Jesus, that race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the finish line, the author, the finisher of our faith. And so procrastination is a dangerous thing because it's just constantly putting things off. Years back, there was a show called the Dobie Gillis Show. And they had this beatnik uh, named uh, uh, Manny G. Krabs. He was lazy. Matter of fact, his body would go into a conniption if he even heard the word work. Amen. Uh, Dobie, uh, Dobie said, well, I got to go to work and made it work. <laughs> he just, he couldn't handle that because work would which upset his entire body. His whole being just went to a tense work uh, because he was lazy. He was always putting things off. Now, you know, people uh, that, that procrastinate, uh, sometimes they're just so busy and too busy minding other people's business that they don't take care of their own business. Now, I know that there are some people that in certain businesses, well, it's a part of their profession. For example, there are, there are a lot of barbers who have, and forgive the term, but they have raggedy looking hair. Because they're just too busy cutting everybody else's hair, making everybody else's hair look nice. There are some plumbers uh, whose uh, plumbing at home goes, uh, goes uh, un uncared for, electricians and uh, uh, HVAC workers who, whose uh, things just kind of run awry because they're overwhelmed with a, a busy schedule of taking care of other people's needs. And I understand that, but in that, they still have to take some time for their own household and for their own family, for their own plumbing, to do their own hair. Amen. Ladies, how would you like to go to a, a beautician and she's going to do your hair and she looks like uh, or for Andy, or a rag doll. Would you, would you go back to that hairdresser? Because maybe you have some reservations about her work. Amen. Uh, how'd you like to go to a dentist that has all their teeth missing, or teeth missing? Uh, so I'm not going to that dentist, praise God. Uh, you, you, you want to make sure that they look like the success that you're trying to achieve. Now, uh, just this morning, I'm snapping to you. Did you notice? Uh, my, my lowers have to be taken out and sent back. 
amen, for servicing by my dentist, amen. So I have my old uh, molars, amen, uh, and to replace that until my new ones come back because they were sent out for service, servicing for two weeks. So for this week and next week, I'm snagging two weeks. But then after two weeks from now, I'll have my teeth back. God be the glory. Amen. Because some folks say, look at him. He's a pastor. He's a preacher. And look at those teeth. Look at that hair. Look at the coat. In other words, we're not trying to impress people, but we're trying to show people that we do have a, a, a nature of self-respect, self-esteem, and respect for you too, as well. But, but procrastination, sometimes people are so busy minding other people's business that they run out of time to do what's necessary to do what they have to do. And there's a whole lot of folk that are frustrated uh, because they're running late for work. Now, if there's someone running late for work every day, sometimes there's a legitimate reason why because of the time schedule. For example, maybe they're babysitting can't get there until a certain time. And their babysitter uh, will get there at a, at a precise moment of time, and now that makes you a little bit late. And so you're going to have to now do what you have to do to get to your job, and you'll always end up late. But it's a legitimate reason why. Now, maybe you can't afford another babysitter that's gonna help you uh, to get there on time or, or closer to on time because it's gonna cost you more money. Maybe this babysitter's free. Maybe this babysitter's a, a little bit more generous than the ones instead of charging you uh, uh, $800 a week to babysit your child, they're only gonna charge you uh, $300 a week to babysit your child, which fits into your budget because you're trying to get a promotion on your job or whatever it is to make ends meet and to cause his family to function properly. There's always a legitimate reason for a lot of things that some people do, but there are other people that are just habitually late, intentionally uh, procrastinating, putting things off. I used to live three blocks from Abraham Clark High School, and there were times, as a youngster, I would end up just making it at the bell. The bell is ringing and I cross the threshold of the homeroom. <laughs> but I should have gotten up earlier, should have taken my bath earlier, to the point that I would have been prepared to get to work, uh, not to work, but to, to school, without expecting, well, that's all right, I'll run, I'll get there on time. My mom, when she worked at Working Company in Rowway, was always one hour early for work. One hour! So that she could take her time. Now, imagine yourself, your mind and, and, and your disposition of mind, so that you're not anxious in, in what my mom is doing. She drives to work, she sits down, has her coffee, can read a newspaper, read the Bible. Uh, you know, she can talk to some of the co-workers, and then about five minutes before punching time, she punches in and goes to work. Now, you can imagine the ease of that day of working. Now, imagine the person that just, just like, oh, oh my goodness, I'm a minute late. Now they're frustrated, there's anxiety going on, they're making mistakes, and then they're going, oh, you're just picking on me, and this is a terrible day, I hate this job. But we have to intentionally decide that we're going to take control of our time schedule as opposed to letting our time schedule take control of us. Monitor your time, adjust your time, go to sleep early, watch less, watch less TV, don't watch TV at all. Do what's necessary so that you can be ahead of things, so that things aren't ahead of you. Because procrastination is a killer. It's a dangerous thing. And so by us putting things off, uh, we can set ourselves up for failure, disaster, destruction. But 
It is important, notice, it is important to wait, yes, but we must resist the temptation to procrastinate. In the Garden of Gethsemane, just before being captured, bludgeoned, tormented, and crucified, our Lord Jesus had to resist the temptation of procrastinating and going to the cross. To die for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 39 to verse 47, says, And he came out and went as he as was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Well, look at this text. Uh, we, we know through the other uh, comparative gospels that Jesus didn't just pray once, but he prayed three times before the Father. Father, if it be thy will, remove this cup from me. He knew that he had that ensuing punishment, torture, and death on that cross that he had to go through. He was trying to put it off. Father, if it be your will, I mean, you want to change it? You want to change the game plan, Father? But the father was saying, no, son. The game plan is not being changed by his silence, by not answering Jesus. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. But Jesus' intent in praying to God the Father was so, so deep-seated. His prayer was so fervent and so anointed and so grief-stricken that his sweat were as if they were great drops of blood falling from his body down to the ground. Can you imagine how intensified those prayers were with Jesus? Have you ever prayed like that? That you were so serious about getting an answer from God that, Lord, you just prayed until every fiber of your being just sweat, almost like great drops of blood falling from your brow. He was desperate for an answer, but desperate for a change because I don't want to do this. And that's what procrastination does. Procrastinate, procrastination says, put it off until another time, till a later time. Hopefully that time will never come. Just keep putting it off and putting it off. One great procrastinator said, I know the answer how it will never happen. It will never come to pass. I'll just say, I'll do it tomorrow. And when tomorrow comes, they come to hold you accountable and say, okay, it's tomorrow. It's time for you to fulfill your obligation. And that wise anchor says, no, it's not. It's today. Tomorrow is tomorrow. See me tomorrow. Tomorrow comes. They say, okay, it's tomorrow. No, it's not. It's today. Tomorrow never comes for that procrastinator. That's the wise anchor. Amen. And so Jesus asked the Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. It's time to do the work that you sent me to do. Nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. 
And then, while we are waiting on the Lord, because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. While we're waiting on the Lord, God wants us to be doing something. Not just sitting there and just laying there and waiting for something to happen. But we need to be in that, that motion of preparation and, and anticipation of doing. Uh, did we get the definition of procrastination? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, we did. Procrastination. Procrastination is to put off intentionally and habitually. Intentionally putting off doing something that should be done. Well, Word of God in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 9 through verse number 28, Jesus is admonishing us that in your waiting, you need to do something called occupy. Occupy until I come in. In other words, until the time arises, get busy and do what's necessary so that when I come, you're set to go. Uh, if you're going on a job interview, don't you want to have a resume? Don't you want to be prepared as to uh, the job that you're being interviewed for? Don't you need to know, know a little bit about something about the business that, or the company that you're trying to interview for? Don't you need to know a little bit about, something about the CEO, about their success rate, what they like, what they don't like? Or you're just going to wait till the last minute. So I'm just going to go to my interview. No plan. I'm just going to go with my, uh, my slippers. I'm going to go with my, my jeans that are hanging down below my waist. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to apply for uh, uh, in, in, an auditor's job in, uh, on Wall Street. And, and, and uh, I've got, I got my jeans you know, hanging down below my belt, my, my waist. Got my slippers on, got my pajama top, and I'm going to interview for this job. No resume, no nothing. Don't know anything about the company, the business, and you're going to try to apply for a job in Wall Street. As soon as they see you in the door, you've already been canceled. Even the ones that dress sharp, if you're not prepared, because you can dress the part, yeah. but have no knowledge of what you're applying for. They're asking for an auditor. And you don't know the first thing about auditing. All I know is one plus one is two. Two plus two is uh, see, five. What, what? Uh, oh, four, that's right. I, I knew that. I was just testing you. No. <laughs> you need to know the responsible parts of what's being required in that job. Jesus said, Verse number 9, chapter 19, and we'll be finishing just a few moments. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. See, Jesus had a mission. He had a responsibility. And did he fulfill his responsibility? He came to seek and to save those that were lost. Did he do that? Or did he look to take a whole lot of vacations and a lot of time off and make excuses of why he's not trying to seek and save those that were lost? Jesus fulfilled everything that he was uh, commissioned by the Father to accomplish. Everything. To the point that on the cross he said, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I've done everything you required me to do. I've lost nothing except one man, the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot. But he was foretold in the scripture. And so, the word of God says, verse 11, and as they heard these things, he added a, a, and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. In other words, while you're waiting for me to come back, I'm going to give you some talents, and I want you to occupy till I come. Make use of what I have given you, 
and what I expect of you until I come back. Occupy until I come. So wait doesn't mean just, just do nothing. Just wait for me, just hold on to what I gave you and do nothing. I want you to take what I've given to you and I want you to use it and I expect an increase when I come back. Occupy until I come. That's what wait means. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him and sent a messenger out to him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. It came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So there's an expectancy to gain something by trading because when he said, occupy till I come, that's what he meant. I expect that when I come back that you have a gain of what I have given you by trading. Verse 16. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Verse 18. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, well, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. And I was trying, trying to butter Jesus up. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. I was trying to suck Jesus out. And he says unto him, out of thine own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man. Trying to use flag. Taking up that I laid not down, and weeping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with interest, with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which, ha which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those my enemies, which were not that I should reign over them, bring him and slay them before me. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. Jesus is expecting a return. He wants us to occupy until he comes. And so procrastination is a death knell uh, to people who should be about accomplishing the things that God has assigned your hands to do. What are you putting off and why? As a matter of fact, uh, there, there are opportunities lost if you and I would all assess or reassess and evaluate our lifespan. There were goals and dreams and aspirations that we had when we were, say, 10, 15, 20 years old. And we said, we're going to accomplish this and accomplish that and accomplish this and accomplish that. But time and chance got involved in our lives and in our plans and goals and dreams and aspirations. And we kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and putting it off, putting it off to the point it never got done. Now you're 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old, and now you're living with regrets. Could have, should have. Would have. I think that's on one of those insurance commercials now. Amen. Uh, I should have done this. I, I, I would have done this. I, I, I could have done this. We make excuses, and now time has just gone right on by us. So the things that you uh, could have done when you were younger, when you had your own bigger vitality and all of the energy, your youthful energy, that's gone now. 
You can't do that anymore. Think of the opportunities lost that will never, ever again come your way because of decisions to put it off and put it off and put it off. And mind you, there are going to be intentional roadblocks in your way to keep you from accomplishing their goals. The devil and his angels are going to work over time to block your goals and dreams and aspirations. People are going to do it, especially your enemies, your haters, the ones that don't even drink haterade, but you would think they do, because they hate you so much, they're trying to block you. They're trying to put roadblocks and, and, and all types of, of schemes uh, to undermine you, undercut you, because they envy you, they're jealous of you. I was just sharing uh, the other night in, in the Bible study, I believe it was the other night, where uh, there was a sister, uh, she fell in love with this uh, fella in the church, but the only problem with her was that this fella was interested in another young lady in the church, and they were so-called, they were somewhat dating each other. And so this sister that envied that other sister for having this brother in the church uh, was given spiritual mind, and she was prophesying, not prophesying, but prophesying. And she would go off, blah, 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 act all spooky, act all spirit, oh, spirit, oh, God is speaking, to oh, he's speaking to me. And he's now, now she goes and she so-called <laughs> prophesies to the sister that was dating this brother. And she said, oh, the Lord said, oh, yeah, 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 the Lord said, go, go. God says, go, the Lord, uh, Africa, Africa, the missionary work, Africa. She's trying to send this young lady off to Africa so she can have this family for herself. She was proper lying, not prophesying, but people do that. And sometimes they're not so spiritual in what they do to seem spiritual, but they, they come uh, across intellectually. And they'll deceive you intellectually. Whatever it is to get your goat, they're going to get your goat. And they will carry it <laughs> when it's all said and done. Anybody have curry goat? Delicious, by the way. Amen. Next, next person making some up. Just, just save me a little, little bit. But, but, but there are people that are blocking. And so you find that you missed your opportunities. The opportunities are gone and will never come back. If not today, if you don't begin doing it now, starting to uh, set the wheels in motion now, when? When will you set the wheels in motion? If not now, then when? So my children inspired me to write a bucket list. And we did it as a family. Now, it kind of like pushed me because it's like, well, my kids are pushing me. Now, stop, stop pushing me. I don't want to be pushed. And especially uh, my, my eldest daughter, Reverend Moret, she said, Dad, let's have a family meeting. And uh, we're going to do bucket lists. It's like, why are you being so specific? Why, why are we having a family meeting? Why are we doing bucket lists? I don't want to do a bucket list. You know, make everybody, you know, uh, set your goals and dreams and aspirations, things like that. Does she do that to you, Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Vision board. And I'm just grateful, though, that that happened because they were putting the pressure, we were putting the pressure on one another yeah. to say, what are your goals? What are your goals? What are your goals? What are your dreams? What are your aspirations? What are your visions? And so now, then she pressed us and said, now let's write it down. Like, oh my God, you're making me to commit to something. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to commit. <laughs> no, because it's in writing. You know, it's almost like making a pledge, you know, to how much tithes and offerings I'm going to pay at the beginning of the year at church. <laughs> oh boy, did you hear what? <laughs> <laughs> but we 
make pledges for mortgages, we make pledges for car notes, we make pledges for everything else. Make a pledge to God, Lord, that's a commitment, I don't want to do that. But the pressure was so that I wrote things down. And I said, okay. And the family wanted me to read it. Brett said, read it. So we read it to each other. Now it's out there. The word is out. I spoke it with my mouth. I wrote it on paper. And every now and then, how you doing with your bucket list, Dad? How you doing with your vision board? And we have the right to challenge one another about that. I, I, I think that we can still do that. Reverend Mike? I think so. Okay. Reverend Mike thinks so. He lives with her, so. <laughs> 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 Praise the Lord. But there's some things that once you check them off, it's like, oh, I did that. I've accomplished something. I waited, and at the proper time, I executed my plan. I, I planned my work, and my, I worked my plan. It feels so good. So I wanted to, in, in my list, I wanted to drive a 57-passenger tour bus. So I've done that. I've driven to Rhode Island, to Massachusetts, Washington, D.C., Virginia, South Carolina, uh, not South Carolina, uh, uh, to, to Connecticut, Pennsylvania, all over the state of New Jersey. I've driven. Uh, so real estate. I was a janitor, custodian. I could book floors with one hand. Praise God. <laughs> there are so many things I just want to do. Amen. Uh, to achieve in life. Amen. The greatest responsibility, I praise God, is to serve God's people in the household of faith. Amen. This is top priority. Praise God. But there are some things I still would like to accomplish at the same time. Mm -hmm. And one of them is, and, and I just got challenged about four weeks ago at, was that Debbie or Kenny's birthday? And at the, at the Bishop, Bishop, Bishop Kenneth DeBow's birthday, I got challenged about this one bucket list uh, situation. And, and the sister said, well, what are you doing about it? That one bucket list request is, I want to fly an airplane. I want to go to the Linden Airport. Mm -hmm. They're giving classes over there uh, to fly a single propeller airplane. Now, young people, 15 years old, are doing it right now. 15, 16, 17, 18. They, have, they, they call it the Explorers Pilot Program, mm -hmm. where young folks, like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, who go to the Linden Airport on Route 1 and 9, right by Home Depot and Checkers, and take your lesson, and eventually, after the training, you can fly that single propeller airplane. I want to do that, at least once. Oh, it's quiet. <laughs> but I want to do that. Because there's something exhilarating about accomplishing something that somebody says you can, but also what I think I can, I think I can do. Because somebody else, Others have done it. Uh, but, but it's not to have bragging rights. I just want to have the experience. I don't know about you. Does anybody ever want to fly an airplane? Any? Brother Carlson? You, what's your name? Lolo. Lolo? You want to fly? Anybody else? Godfrey? Now think about it. Uh, I don't know how old you are, Lolo, but you're young enough to become a jet fighter. Did you realize that? How old are you, if, if I may ask? 18. You're young enough to become a jet fighter pilot flying an F-15, the one of the supersonic jets, or even a stealth fighter through the Air Force. And you can be one of those highly decorated uh, airplane pilots. And who knows, you might become an astronaut. And we'll all salute you, Lord, for being an astronaut. Amen. For being a fighter pilot. Because you have youth on your side. And if that's your dream, go after it. Pursue it. Seek the face of God for his approval. And if he's saying, yeah, Lord, go. Go, Lord, go. 
Especially when God has given the green light and God has given the go, go. Because I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. Because in the meantime, myself and Godfrey and Carson, we're just wishing and hoping and dreaming and planning. <laughs> but you can do. You can go. But at the same time, now, don't get jealous because myself and Godfrey and Carson might take some lessons and fly before you. Because one of us might decide, I'm going to go sign up this week at the Lincoln Airport to take a pilot's license. Because you know what the sister did to me at the restaurant at Bishop Kenneth DeVal's uh, birthday uh, party? We were sitting at the, uh, what was that, the steakhouse or something in Old Bridge. She said, so, so what are you doing about it? You know, she had a, pardon me, she had her glasses on. And she said, so what are you doing about it? What's taking you? What are you waiting for? And I had nothing else to say, but you know, sis, you're right. So I guess in a few weeks, uh, ask me if I signed up yet. <laughs> <laughs> Deacon Ed, are you ever planning on flying an airplane? Do you have any goals or dreams or anything that, that you'd like to fulfill before you check out? It's a lot, but uh, I keep it under down low. Oh, keep it under, under down low? Not, not that other down low, but the down low. Right, right. Yes, because they, they, cha they change the term on us. <laughs> Every time you establish a term, they, they flip the script. <laughs> you know, we say, I'm, I'm going to keep it on the down low. And, All right, okay, so that, that's still, nigga. I'm going to keep it on the wraps, you know, right? But now they say, I'm keeping it on the down low, you know? <laughs> So there are people forever changing the narrative. But dig in that, pursue those goals and dreams and aspirations. I'm saying it to everybody in the house. Does anybody have any goals or dreams or aspirations that you're trying that you would love to pursue? Lenny, what about you? Uh, working. Working, okay. All right, so tomorrow you're going to go apply for a job. Oh, you want to go to work too? Okay, good. And, and you want to hopefully get a promotion. So you work so that you can get a promotion. You try to be the best worker in that whole organization, okay? All right. And you get a new job, promotion. Anybody? I'm sorry? More hours on the job. More hours on the job. Oh, more hours on the job. So when they see how great of a worker you are, they always say, we don't give you any more hours. So you have to, you have to engage yourself to set yourself up for success so that when people see you work and they see your work ethic, they say, boy, he is a great worker. He's an active worker. Let's give him some more hours. Let's give him a promotion. You have to activate yourself. You can't just wait, you know, to get more hours. And you also have to ask. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. And then seek and you shall by knock and the door shall be open. The door's just not going to automatically open. You're not going to automatically find, and it's not going to automatically be given to you to your ass and get knock. Anybody else? Yes, Godfrey. I started writing a book. You start I'm writing a book? By next year. By next year. Did you start yet? Yeah. Okay, good, good. And what's your goal? What's your deadline? Um, next year. Next year, what, what month? Uh, I would say probably by towards the end of the year. Towards the end of the year, like what month? December. December. Okay, that's the end of the year. Okay, so <laughs> have, have you broken up the plan and, you know, given yourself some timelines as to what should be accomplished here or what accomplished here? You've done that. Okay. And, and so by December, we're going to pray that Godfrey has his book published by next December. And every now and then, would you mind if the folks ask you how you're doing with your book? Yeah. No okay, problem. he doesn't mind. Okay, thank you. Who else? Yes. You want to be a what? A banker. Oh, a banker. Did you say a banker or banker? Banker. Banker. Okay. Have you taken any culinary uh, courses? I'm in the class right now. You're in the class, see? Right now. So you set the gears in motion, right? Uh, do you know any excellent bakers? You don't know any? 
How about in your family? Are there any folks in your family that are very good bakers? No? Okay, so you need to meet somebody that's excellent at baking. So go to a bakery. Go to Pino's. Talk to Julie or her husband, Rob. And see if, uh, are you working now? Where? Old Navy. Where? Old Navy. Old Navy. So maybe you need to, if you want to be a baker, you need to start thinking about working in a bakery. Or, and and take it, you're taking the course, but work around folks that are get, going to get you to where you have to go. Amen. So that you can have experience. Because people that are in college, uh, that are studying a particular major, I know I'm taking a little long, but this, this is important for our survival, for our lives, amen. But people that are in college, if you're pursuing a certain career, then you need to also intern doing some of those things that are, uh, that entail the work that you're pursuing, the career and the profession that you're pursuing. So that if you want to become a medical doctor, then you're going to have to do some things, maybe CPR, first aid, ambulance squad, uh, start taking some nursing courses or whatever is necessary, but then also volunteer in the hospital, volunteer in the nursing homes or whatever, so you're surrounding yourselves in the profession of the, of the medical profession, if that's what you're pursuing, but with the bakery profession, you're going to have to surround yourself with that, that environment so that you'll have all kinds of information that can't be taken away, so that you can be the number one baker. Watch the cooking shows, the cooking channel. Do you watch those? Are you getting any ideas from them? Okay, so take those ideas, take those suggestions, and then make your own special big good. <laughs> Amen. Something that you can take uh, to the shark tank and say, taste this. And when their mouths are so watery that they, as, as sophisticated and rich as they are, they can't control salvation because it's so delicious, because Lola made this cake or pie or whatever it was, or this tart. They say, oh my goodness. Who made this? Did you know that famous Amos made chocolate chip cookies and become a multi-millionaire from chocolate chip cookies? Who's that lady uh, that uh, sold her goods? Is it Sylvia? From New York, from Harlem, is it? Sylvia. Sylvia? Sylvia? Yeah. Cotton greens. I think that she made yams too. Right? She became so popular and so famous from her cooking that she, I guess she maybe sold the rights, but anyway, she got it canned. Famous Amos sold his rights. He shouldn't have done that because people were making a mint off of his cookies, just chocolate chip cookies. So who else? Who else? Who else? Goals, dreams, aspirations. And you don't have to say what it is, but who has goals, dreams, and aspirations? Something that you'd like to accomplish. Don't put it off. Because before you know it, you'll look back and say, I lost all this time. And life has just passed me by because that's what life is doing right now. We just lost since, since 1030, we almost lost two hours of life. It just went right on by. And you can't recoup that. You can't get it back. There's only one life. And it's that one life to live. What we do for Christ, definitely, it will last. But we have to take advantage of the time that we're living right now. This is right now time, real time. So do what's necessary. Do it now. If God is inspiring you and leading you to do it now, don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Do it now. Because if not now, then when? Tomorrow, I thought about tomorrow. I think it is. I give my life tomorrow. Here it is. I thought about today, but it's so much easier to say tomorrow. What is it? Who promised you tomorrow? You ought to choose the Lord today. For tomorrow, very well might be too late. Right? <clears throat> tomorrow, I'll give my life tomorrow. I thought about today. 
but it's so much easier to say tomorrow who promised you tomorrow you ought to choose the Lord today cause tomorrow very well might be too late Amen Wait but don't procrastinate there's so much more to say but the doors of the church and now we're I don't know what decisions you have to make to unfrustrate your life. Because the decisions that we fail to make have, has caused so much frustration until now. But there's no sense in trying to, as they say, cry over spilled milk. The milk is spilled. The water has gone under the bridge. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow may never be mine. But that songwriter said, but Lord, for my sake, help me to take one day at a time. God, help me to capitalize on you this day. Make this moment count. Make this hour count. Make this day count. Make my life count. I don't want to be a dash on a tombstone between birthday and death day. An, un an, an, an unknown dash, an unknown period of accomplishments. I don't want to be a, a poof, like a vapor that appeared for a moment and just vanishes away like steam off of a kettle or a hot pot. But I want this dash to mean something. I want this dash to mean that I met Jesus. I want this dash to, to, to mean that I knew God for myself and he inspired me in such a way that I took it upon myself to do something about it, to occupy it until he comes, to get busy for God to, to, to show the world that God didn't make me for naught, but he gave me a purpose and a reason for living. He made me so that I can let my light so shine before men, women, boys, and girls that they may see my good works and in turn, as a result, they will glorify my Father, which is in heaven. That dash that I live means, God, you get all the glory. That dash means you get all the praise. That dash means I made something of my life. I didn't hide the talents. I didn't hide the dreams and the goals and the aspirations. I fulfilled everything that you sent me down here on earth to accomplish. It is finished. <laughs> And I can go home in peace. I can go home with eternal rest to say, I've done all that you've assigned my hands to do. And so now, Lord, may the works that I've done, let them speak for me. Hallelujah. That song says, and you can join with me, May the works I've done speak for me. Oh, uh -huh.
to tell us to get on the mark and to get set and to get ready to go. And when you give us the go, God give us the grace to go and to do and to be. Hallelujah. Knowing that you're with us, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us, but you'll be with us always to the end of the world that we're going with God and with God for us. Who can be against us when everybody else says that it's folly and that it's useless and senseless to even think such folly in their opinion? But Lord God, you proved the naysayers wrong with Sarah, Abraham's wife. You proved the naysayers wrong with Mary, your mother, Jesus. You proved the naysayers wrong with our matriarchs and patriarchs of faith that thought, hallelujah, that there was no way out, but you made a way when you, hallelujah, opened the mouths or you shut the mouths of the lions in the den of Daniel. God, you, you cooled down the flames of the fire of the furnace of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, you made a way, hallelujah, for David. You made a way for Daniel. You made a way for Esther. You made a way for Joseph. You made a way for Jacob. You made a way, oh God, hallelujah, for countless amounts of people. And being that you're not a respectful person, you make a way for me. Hallelujah. have your way. Through this song, Lord, have thy own way. Children sing. Ah. Oh. 